you're about to see a whole new breed of Mustang. Presenting the all-new 79 Mustang from Ford. Back in 1979, Ford introduced a new rear-wheel drive car platform known internally as Fox to underpin several new models, such as the new Thunderbird, Mercury Cougar, and Capri, and even the Lincoln Continental. But the most famous iteration of the Fox platform was the third-generation Mustang, which became one of the most popular sports cars of the 1980s. The Mustang became the last Fox car, and even continued with a modified Fox platform for the fourth gen in 1994. This is a story of the third-generation Ford Mustang, most commonly known as the Fox Body Mustang. This is my old car. Capture the new breed of Mustang for 79 at your Ford dealer now. Melvin Stark, CPA, is about to break free. Yahoo! In Ford Mustang, a sports car for the 80s. So before anyone says it, yes, my typical rule for this channel is to only feature cars which are no longer in production. Not only is the Mustang still in production, there is an all new model expected in 2023 as a 2024 model. And from what I've read, it will still have a gas engine, not electric, at least not yet. But the version of the Mustang that lived through the 1980s and early 90s was a much different car than it is today. Gal, we're stepping out tonight. Melvin, is that you? Yep. Yes. So much so that I felt this era of the Mustang deserved its own episode. And then there is the term Fox Body, which I have always thought was the commonly agreed name for these Mustangs. However, I had one viewer comment from way back when I did my Ford Probe episode that it should only be called the Fox Platform, not Fox Body. Let me know which term you think is correct. Speaking of the Ford Probe, it will be mentioned in this episode, since the Mustang almost joined many of the other former Fox cars that moved to front-wheel drive, and it could have become the Probe instead. With the Mustang 2 having been on the same platform as the Ford Pinto. Mustang 2, it's incredible and it's mine. The designers were tasked to make some radical changes for the Mustang's third generation, but to also create a platform that could be adapted to other Ford sedans and wagons. The Mustang would be the shortest version of the Fox platform, with others first going to the Ford Fairmont and Mercury Zephyr, whose very unsporty styling could never have been confused with the Mustang. The Fox platform was even used for a short-lived model called the Durango, long before Dodge used the name for an SUV. It was a successor to the Ranchero, and a direct competitor to the Chevy El Camino. For the Mustang, despite the direction to give it an all-new look from the car it was replacing, the designers also got competing direction from Chairman Henry Ford II, who wanted to maintain the more upright and slightly forward-leaning front end that had been a Mustang styling cue since the first generation. There were a total of three design teams assigned to the task. Two were based in Dearborn, Michigan, and one in Ford of Europe's Ghia studio in Italy. The final design that we know today came under the direction of Jack Telnack, formerly the Vice President of Design at Ford of Europe, who joined one of the Dearborn teams in April of 1975 and steered his team away from Henry Ford II's rule about the upright front end, and instead introduced a slant back front end with square quad headlamps, and offered both a notchback and hatchback variants. Although today it may look like a very typical early 80s design, for the late 70s the concept was almost revolutionary. The public loved it, buying up almost 370,000 of them for the 1979 model year. Just two trim levels were available at first, a base model and a more upscale Ghia model, but were soon joined by the Cobra model, with a non-functional hood scoop to accommodate the turbocharger atop the 2.3 liter 4, which only made 131 horsepower. Or you could get the 4.9 liter V8, marketed as the 5.0, which you'd think was a lot more powerful, but alas, it was not, making only 139 horsepower. Although that was far better than the base engine choice, the 2.3 naturally aspirated 4 that carried over from the Pinto, making only 88 horsepower. In 1980, the 4.9 liter was downsized to 4.2 liters and only 120 horsepower, making it the lowest powered V8 ever in a Mustang. Despite the low horsepower numbers, the Mustang still managed to earn the right to be a pace car at the Indianapolis 500 for 1979. I'll be driving this specially modified Mustang to pace the Indy 500, and you can buy this beautiful limited edition version of the Indy Mustang at your local Ford dealer. The three pace cars used in the race had custom T-tops made by Cars and Concepts of Brighton, Michigan, whereas the production pace car replicas all had sunroofs. This is Jackie Stewart in the pace car. We're now between turn one and turn two here. We're doing 50 miles an hour right in the bottom, right in the center of the racetrack. 
Cars and Concepts would later offer the same T-tops to production cars, starting in 1981. Beginning in 1982, Ford dropped the Cobra trim and replaced it with the GT, returning as a trim level after a 13-year absence. A three-engineered 4.9-liter V8 made 157 horsepower, allowing for the letters HO to be added alongside the 5.0. 1982 was also the first year that Ford offered the SSP model, which stood for Special Service Package, better known as the Mustang Cop Car. The SSP lasted until 1993, with almost 15,000 sold to law enforcement agencies all across the United States and Canada during its 11-year run. <laughs> Yet despite the higher performance variants, by 1983, much of the excitement of the new Fox Mustang that resulted in record sales in 1979 had died down considerably, as sales for the 1983 model year were down to around 120,000, or less than a third of the 1979 total. So whether your street is Sunset, or Woodward Avenue, or Route 66 through Amarillo, the word is out. It's Mustang GT. The boss is back. Thank you and hello again, everybody. Welcome to America's Top 10. This 1983 total even includes the convertible model, which was introduced that year after a nine-year absence. Cars and Concepts, the same company which did the T-top conversions, also did the convertible. In 1984, being the 20th anniversary of the Mustang, Ford released a commemorative GT350 model, but bigger news for performance enthusiasts that year was the SVO, the first car to be developed by Ford's Special Vehicle Operations Team, which was first formed in 1981. Although it seems logical that the SVO would have used the 4.9 liter V8 as a starting point, fuel economy was still a serious concern back then, so the team reworked the turbo version of the 2.3 liter 4. The new Mustang SVO. The machine speaks for itself. Which was still based on the original Pinto design. It managed to increase its output to 175 horsepower. It also had four-wheel ventilated disc brakes, specially designed pedals to allow for heel and toe shifting, sport seats, and a unique front end with quad headlamps changed to dual and repositioned turn signals. By 1986, these square headlamps would eventually transition to a composite design that foreshadowed a new look that would be on all Mustangs the following year. And the SVO engineers managed to tweak the Turbo 4 to make 200 horsepower and added a double spoiler, reminiscent of the one on the Mercure XR4Ti. However, the SVO model itself didn't make it that long, with 1986 being its last model year. 1987 marked the beginning of the Mustang catching up with the other Ford models, which had transitioned to composite headlamps resulting in a much more streamlined and aerodynamic look. look. Don't use both feet at the same time. You know, just use the gas. But and then when you want... Okay, so one foot. One pedal at a time. Okay, I will do it. It also had an all-new dash and new seats. With the SVO model discontinued, trim levels were limited to the LX and GT, with the GT sporting new round fog lamps and a unique louver design in the taillights. Yet despite all the changes, sales didn't improve much, with under 160000 for the 1987 model year. Although this was still a respectable number, Ford execs were disappointed that the Mustang couldn't hold on to the sales numbers it once had in 1979. If you don't shut up, I'm going to put the car in park and just sit here. <laughs> Ooh. With so many of their cars moving to front-wheel drive as its popularity grew, Ford execs began to consider a redesign of the Mustang to a front-wheel drive model and work with partner Mazda to develop it. But when news leaked that Ford was planning this radical change, Mustang fans rebelled and convinced Ford to keep the Mustang in its current form. But Ford didn't give up on the Mazda design, as that model became the Ford Probe. Check out my episode on the Probe to learn more about that car. Yo, fuck nuts! It's probing time. Wow. With the introduction of the Ford Probe keeping the Mustang on its rear drive Fox platform, engineers at Ford started planning for its next generation to begin for the 1994 model year. The Mustang remained the only model to still use the Fox platform, with several models across Ford, Mercury, and Lincoln having either been discontinued, such as the Ford Fairmont, Durango, Granada, and LTD, and the Mercury Marquis and Zephyr, or had transitioned to new platforms, such as the Ford Thunderbird, Mercury Cougar and Capri, and the Lincoln Continental and Mark series. The cost of the LX model went to above $10,000 for the first time in 1991 which likely contributed to sales for the Fox Mustang dropping under 100,000 for the first time, with only around 90,000 sold. Even worse for 1992, with only around 73,000 sold. For people who want more out of life, than a little peace and quiet. 
But a more notable new addition was the SVT Cobra, with the SVT referring to Ford's special vehicle team that had formed in 1991. The Cobra's 4.9-liter V8 was upgraded to 235 horsepower and had 17-inch wheels, the biggest wheels on a Mustang up to that point. Yet despite the higher horsepower, it had a softer ride than the GT, thanks to modifications to the springs and sway arms. Just under 5,000 Cobras were produced for 1993, but even more exclusive was the Cobra R, of which only 107 were produced. SVT Cobra R. Well, that's right. When you see one of these coming down the street and the fog light holes are empty, that is the Cobra R. The Cobra R had the same engine, but unique brakes and radiator and it was stripped down to the essentials for racing, with air conditioning, all interior power accessories, and the rear seats removed. With the start of the fourth generation Mustang in 1994, that technically was the end of the Fox platform, which, at 14 years, was the longest generation for the Mustang. But I say technically, because the fourth gen was an updated version of the Fox platform, codenamed SN95. From the outside, the fourth gen looked like an entirely different car, thanks to much rounder styling, which had become a trademark look for Ford in the 90s. It wouldn't be until the fifth generation that started in 2005 that the look of the Mustang returned to what Henry Ford II would have definitely approved of, had he still been alive, thanks to a retro design that harked back to the first generation. With 14 years of Fox Body Mustangs, and over 2.5 million sold, one may think there should be plenty of them left to choose from for collectors, but due to the fuel economy requirements imposed on many of them, the end result were cars that many owners simply didn't take care of with any thought that they may be worth more someday. And many of the higher performance models were used and abused by multiple owners, or modified enough to seriously limit their potential future value. As a result, Fox Body Mustangs in good condition are becoming harder to find and are starting to rise in value. They may not have the popularity of the first gen, but they also don't have the stigma that the Mustang II did, having been based on the Pinto. And like many 80s cars, they are becoming more and more popular at car shows and auctions. As I noted earlier, a seventh generation Mustang is due to arrive in 2023. Once that happens, the Mustang will officially be the only vehicle Ford sells in North America that isn't an SUV, truck, van, or crossover, since their only other car, the Ford GT, is slated to end production by December of 2022. The Mustang is part of a dwindling two-door, four-seat sports car market, especially among American automakers. The Chevy Camaro's future is uncertain, and although the Dodge Challenger still sells well, it will likely be going all-electric in the near future. A car market that no one could have imagined over 40 years ago when the Fox Body, or is it the Fox Platform, first debuted. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid-2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time.